Welcome back, Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really pleased to have David Rosenberg with us again. Today, David is certainly well known to any of you who have watched, uh, so who as a regular practice watched CNBC or Bloomberg over the years. Uh, he's uh, the founder and president of Rosenberg Research and Associates. Uh, it's an independent financial markets and economic consulting firm launched in 2020, about the time that we last had David on the show when he launched uh, that new venture of his. Uh, he is also the author of Breakfast with Dave. That's a daily distillation a distillation of, uh, of his economic and financial market insights and forecasts, uh, and that will remain the centerpiece of the suite of products he is now offering. In his new venture, uh, you can go to RosenbergResearch.com, RosenbergResearch.com, uh, to learn more about him. David certainly is, is a well-known economist and uh, he spent years at Gluskin Chef and before that uh, at Bank of America as a head e- economist uh, for Bank of America. That is uh, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, uh, 2000 to 2009. And uh, uh, he certainly is uh, very well known and very highly regarded. And I really value him for his independent thinking, uh, which is why he's here today to tell us that we shouldn't have to worry too much about inflation over the longer term anyway. Uh, before I say hello to David, I should also say that he is sharing a very extensive deck of charts uh, that really is, illustrate his views on the economy, uh, and he he believes the worries, as I mentioned, about inflation is, is overblown, uh, but you can uh, quickly and easily gain access to David's charts. very kind of him to make them available to you. Uh, if you go to J. Taylor Media, J. Taylor Media, Dot com. Click on the banner on the right side of the f- homepage, right above David Stockman's banner, and just, just click on there and uh, enter your email, and you can get this wonderful deck of charts, which I've uh, looked at before the show today. Very interesting, and they do tell a story, I think, very well fit David's view of the economy. David, thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. You know, um, you, again... As I as I mentioned, I think you believe that this inflation hysteria, uh, you would call it a hysteria, I guess, that a lot of people are very worried about inflation, uh, comparing it to the 1970s. Uh, you think it's very overblown, and I want to thank you very much for making your, that uh, deck of charts available to us. Uh, on page four, I'd like to maybe refer to some of the things in your in your chart book. On page four... Uh, of that deck, you you cite Bob Farrell's ten market rules. Obviously, believe you believe those rules should be paid attention to at this time when people are freaking out about the possibilities of a return to stagflation or something worse. Uh, what can you tell us about Farrell's rules as they apply uh, to the current market situation? Well, look, it's uh, you know the the, the rule about um, when all the uh uh, forecast and experts agree something else is likely to happen. Uh, I think really fits the bill right now uh, on this score. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's a there's a whole range. I mean, all ten really matter. Uh, you know, the the, the that uh, you know that um, you know the bubbles go further than you think, but they don't correct by going sideways. Uh, you know, he uses the term exponentially rising or falling markets. They don't correct by going sideways, and uh, we are mm-hmm. into a variety. Um, of asset bubbles, uh, not only in equities, um, but also in residential real estate. And I do think that um, uh, crypto or Bitcoin, uh, despite its practical uses, yeah, is in a gigantic uh, price bubble. And when people confront me with how they value Bitcoin on the uh, outstanding value of gold, I say, well, why not just buy the gold? Uh, yeah. Buy what you're valuing uh, this um, uh <laughs> digital currency against. But, you know, uh, I would just say that, um, you know, th- those are the 10 market rules to remember. Those are the 10 commandments of investing. Uh, the most important one uh, is, as you said, uh, is that when everybody is on the same side of the trade, uh, mm-hmm. it's an overcrowded trade. Uh, your initial comment on inflation, well, I mean, you just have to, uh, you know, Google, uh, do a, a word search on inflation. And, of course, mm-hmm. it's your introductory to me. Um, about, uh, you know, about inflation. And I ask most people if they can even define what inflation is for me. Uh, mm-hmm. And they say, yeah, it's rising prices. But that's <laughs> not what it is. Uh, no. So, yeah, you know, and then you ask, you know, what's your model? Well, just they'll say to me, well, you know, look at your, look at the CRB index, look at lumber, look at copper, 
look at cotton, look at corn. Uh, and I just find it amazing that, you know, there's been economists, PhD economists that have spent their lives and, and have written scholarly research reports in the journals on modeling inflation. And I speak to people on Wall Street and Bay Street and Howe Street and Montgomery Street, and everybody thinks they have inflation figured out. Um, and uh, everybody has a one variable model when it comes to inflation. And guess what it is? It's the CRB index. Yeah. So, look, I've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. just earlier today I heard uh, about Charlie Plosser, who headed up the Fed, saying he's concerned about policy is following the pattern of the 1960s and 1970s. Well, what does this economy today have in common with anything in the 60s and 70s when the economy was unionized? Mm-hmm. And we had, you know, when you ask somebody about a cola today, they think you're talking about a soft drink. A cola back in the 60s and 70s was a cost of living adjustment. You see, inflation was institutionalized. Yeah. We had a much more regulated, unproductive economy. I mean, the GATT round of global negotiations that ultimately broke down not just trade barriers globally, but non-trade barriers, non-tariff barriers. The GATT rounds of negotiations didn't end until 1979. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have global competition. Uh, Mm -hmm. We hardly had domestic competition. Mm -hmm. And um, we had a completely different demographic and Mm -hmm. a, a completely inflexible labor market. There's nothing. So when people are saying this is the 60s or 70s, uh, I just roll my eyes. Like, you know, you really, you surely must adjust for what we're seeing today. I mean, the level of the, the, the rate of the rate of automation, the, the productivity, uh, the share of technology spending in the U.S. economy today is a share of GDP is infinitely bigger than it was in the 1960s and 1970s. Mm-hmm. And, and it's one thing nobody talks about. People talk about wages. They don't talk about productivity. And so people say, well, we have the wages, we got the bonuses, companies have to attract labor. Productivity growth in the United States right now is running over 4% year over year. Now, it's mm-hmm. hard to make book as to whether or not, you know, that's a real fundamental shift. Is it noise? But how come, you know, when you talk to people about, let me ask you, Jay, when you ask people about inflation, do they mm-hmm. ever even mention the word productivity to you? Do they not understand there is a huge no. inverse correlation between productivity no. and inflation? And these no. people are telling you about the 1960s and 70s when no. productivity was stagnant. Yeah. Well, no, that's very the mother's milk. The mother's milk for inflation ultimately mm-hmm. is productivity adjusted wages. It's called unit labor costs. Mm-hmm. And we don't we so, don't even have wages right now rising as fast as productivity. Uh, mm-hmm. And so, no, if you're actually putting on your thinking hat and not being reactionary and not mm-hmm. focusing on the noise, but actually on the fundamentals, no, no, this is actually, yes, we do have right now a serious maladjustment in the economy. We do have for a period of time a a, a situation where the demand for merchandise goods has outrun the production. And a lot of this is just basically related back to the pandemic. Mm-hmm. And the policy response to the pandemic, um, and we do have supply chain difficulties right now. Only a fool mm-hmm. would say that we're not. Uh, mm-hmm. So then paint a picture of long-term inflation from what is really conflicting and confounding noise coming from the pandemic. To me, the people that that make that as part of their narrative uh, for their clients, uh, I think are doing a real disservice. Mm-hmm. Well, you, you mentioned stagnant wages. Uh, wages aren't going up as fast as productivity, but hasn't that been something that's been happening over the last couple of decades, in fact? And we're seeing uh, a hollowing out of the middle class to a great extent. You know, the top 10% are doing okay. The top 1% or one-tenth of a percent are doing extremely well. And this has seemed to bring about some of this populist movement in America. First, I think Trump was a reaction to that. But I think Biden is, too, and Bernie Sanders and that crowd. Uh, We're seeing some what I would consider far-left economic policies, massive amounts of of stimulus that are going into the system. Uh, But don't we have some real problems here, too, in terms of the this this, you know, this um, redistribution of wealth uh, and the political reaction that is sort of if you if you see it that way, um, a political reaction that is coming as a result of this 
I mean, there are, there are a lot of social problems in America is what I'm getting to. It seems to be, you know, and I'm, I'm not proposing uh, socialist solutions to those problems, but I'm just, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that. Well, look, um, you know, these are very complex social issues that you're bringing up uh, that have been around for a long time period. Mm-hmm. Um, we thought they might get redressed with President Obama, but in fact, these inequalities got worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and look, we we thought uh, the everybody thought that we elected this uh, socialist from Arkansas in 1992 with his wife in the Oval Office to revolutionize health care. And uh, Bill Clinton uh, is next thing you know he's cutting uh, capital gains taxes mm-hmm. uh, in the later part of that decade. You know, with Bob mm-hmm. Rubin and Larry Summers. So yeah. Um, so so you know what you see isn't always what you get. Um, Donald yeah. Trump was supposed to be the populist and the nationalist and the protectionist. Uh, and uh, these wealth inequalities and income inequalities, you can argue, got even worse under his tenure. So, And there's no question that the pandemic um, exacerbated uh, mm-hmm. the gap between the haves and the have-nots. And fiscal policy was an attempt uh, to uh, redress that. But remember that, you know, most of these, these stimulus checks and the extended emergency jobless benefits are really just very short-term uh, Band-Aid solutions. Mm-hmm. You know, when, you, when you really think of it, um, you know, the, the wealth inequalities has really come from decades of Fed policy mm-hmm. aimed at uh, having your back as an investor. You can't talk to anybody in the markets and not say, well, the Fed has your back. Yeah, the mm-hmm. Fed has your back to promote asset inflation. Uh, and so that asset inflation is beneficiary for parts of the population that, uh, that own those assets, uh, principally, mm-hmm. uh, the equity market. So, mm-hmm. uh, the Fed's actions, uh, you know, when the Fed was, uh, threatening to come in and buy high yield over a year ago, people were asking me, do you think they'll ever come in and buy the stock market? Because, of course, junk bonds resides in the capital structure right next to equities. Mm-hmm. Right. So we we have that situation where, you know, well, the Fed has our back. Um, I mean, people talk about the Fed today. The Fed's talking about unemployment. I mean, the, Powell is talking about social policy issues, although the Fed is really not equipped to deal with those things. That's why we right. have a government. The central bank is a central bank. Um, but, you know, the, the the issues that you're bringing up, I mean, look, it's, it's a... Um, it's a real mystery. I mean, at some point we have to ask, what is it that we really want? Uh, people talk mm-hmm. about new eras. Uh, we thought we had a new era with Donald Trump, um, but what happened in 2018 is that the midterm elections got in the way. Everybody thinks now we have, as you just said, we have a, you know, one of Bob Farrell's rules, right, is that there are no new eras. And certainly yeah. in the United mm-hmm. States, uh, a two-year political cycle uh, is not built for new eras. Uh, everybody's telling me after Donald Trump gets elected to go read Hillbilly Elegy. Well, Jake, mm-hmm. do you hear anybody telling you to read Hillbilly Elegy today? Uh, no. You know, or, or do they ask you to start reading books on modern monetary theory? But the thing no. is that these, these are two-year political cycles. Uh, I don't think a, a, a lot's going to get done. I don't believe in this view that we have a new political culture uh, mm-hmm. for for higher inflation. I don't believe that's the case at all. Uh, you know, you take a look at uh, what's happening. It's very interesting to me that when you look at Donald Trump's electoral loss, it really came down to his character, or I guess you would say his lack of character. His yeah. ratings on the economy were spectacular. I mean, that was the strongest suit. And when he right. went up uh, on the hustings and uh, he would talk about the lowest unemployment rate heading into the pandemic for Hispanics and for African Americans and for the youth and for females, he was 100% right. Their unemployment mm-hmm. rates went down to historic lows uh, for all minorities. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he was right about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he didn't, and, and when you look at his ratings on the economy, his handling of the economy was always consistently very high. He didn't rank so high in other areas. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I don't really quite see that uh, the Democrats have a big mandate for the sort of changes they might think that they want to put into the system. They only have really a two year opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, no, I don't think that uh, we're going to be seeing um, a, a, a sustainable move here towards redressing um, these inequalities. Uh, and, and then you're taking a look, for example, you know, uh, you know, will 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 he get will Biden get this infrastructure package through um, without uh, pursuing tax increases? Well, who are the tax mm-hmm. increases on? 
Uh, well, you know, they are they are on high income earners and they're on capital. But you can mm-hmm. see right now, even within his own party, uh, the fiscal conservatives don't want to go that route. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So I'm not of the view that we're in some sort of new era of sustainable mm-hmm. fiscal and monetary reflation. You know, people thought that that, that that we had that under Alan Greenspan, Ben Bernanke. The whole process, certainly, of, of creating inflation out of thin air, it, it's been tried. It's not that easy. And in an environment mm-hmm. where we have inordinate debt burden, uh, which have only mm-hmm. gotten worse, Mm-hmm. And we're all a year older from where we were a year ago. And, and, and I know there's people that think it's the opposite, but there is a negative correlation between aging populations and inflation. Just ask mm-hmm. anybody who lives in Japan about that. Mm-hmm. Um, so the structural forces, what I'm getting to here is that, you know, the structural forces that were in place before the pandemic that created the conditions for sustainable disinflation. And I'm talking about debt. I'm talking about uh, demographics, I'm talking about disruptive technology, are so much bigger than the price mm-hmm. of copper, corn, and crude. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are the overriding elements, and, and, and if anything, they have become more, more disinflationary. And I would say that mm-hmm. the biggest source of disinflation and why the money velocity numbers and the mm-hmm. credit multiplier in the banking system has pretty well broken down yeah. is because the ratio of debt to GDP at all levels of society in the United States during this pandemic to save the system Mm -hmm. across household, business, and government sectors, it's 370% of GDP. Yeah, higher than World War II. Yes, and and, and, and I'll tell you that when you look at what the cutoff point, what was the critical cutoff point where – the debt got too big for its own good and produced these disinflationary, deflationary outcomes uh, was back in the dot-com bubble when that debt ratio crossed 250% for the first time. <laughs> now it's 370%. Wow. So, the fact, so that, these... the fact that this debt ratio, Jay, has exploded 40 mm-hmm. percentage points in the span of a year, that's never happened before. And people just don't understand when, mm-hmm. how important a deflationary metric that is, because mm-hmm. they're too tied to their Bloomberg terminal looking at the CRB index. But that's mm-hmm. why the credit multiplier is broken down. That's why the loan deposit ratio in the bank system is broken down. That's why money velocity is broken down and, and rendered the monetary aggregates on their own to be a pretty useless set of statistics mm-hmm. as a barometer of anything in the right. context so, of contracting money velocity. Yeah. So, David, if um, we, we've got this, so what you're saying is we've got a lot of productivity gains ahead of us here that will offset, and uh, and then you have the drag, the debt drag, that is a drag on the economy, and the velocity can't get going because there's too much debt in the system relative to income. Um, what then? Uh, I, what then do you like? What do you what do you think? Where do you think people should be focused? Then their investments. I think it was slide ten. You showed that sixty five percent of the people in a Barron's poll thought that stocks were the were the place to be. Uh, that was the the most attractive asset. I think something like um, only twelve percent or so thought commodities were attractive. Only eight percent liked real estate. Only five percent liked gold. It seems to me what you're saying that the electrification, uh, to what extent that that happens, a lot of these new technologies require some metals along the way. There's some shortages. We were just talking to my guest before you came on, tin, a company that's finding tin in Bolivia. Didn't realize it, but there's a shortage, relative shortage of tin. I mean, what do you like, David, as we go forward? We only have a few minutes left, but what do you think people should be focused on? What segments of the economy are you bullish on now? Because as Bob Farrell says, bull markets are more fun than bear markets. So help help us have some fun. I get that, but the question is a bull market and what? And of course, yeah, you know, exactly. the implication is well, we're talking equities. But look, there is a 75% time-worn inverse correlation between the debt ratio I talked about and core inflation. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think here's what's going to happen. And all this fiscal stimulus you've seen is temporary. We're going to have a fiscal withdrawal in the second half of the year, just as 
a lot of the supply is coming back on stream. It's disingenuous to say, oh, the reopening trade only influences demand, but it won't influence supply. Supply will come back with a lag. So mm-hmm. I think that the inflation concerns are overdone. I think inflation expectations come down. I think people will be surprised at um, at how the pace of economic activity moderates in the second half of the year. So I think we're going to get a bull flattening in the yield curve. So I'm bullish mm-hmm. on long bonds. Uh, and I'm bullish on anything that would be correlated against that. I think that if I'm right on slower growth and lower rates, uh, lower market rates, uh, then I would say that without being bullish or bearish on the stock market, I tell you right now, that will favor uh, growth over value. Now, maybe you want to have growth at a reasonable price, uh, but that would be uh, defensive tech. It could be utilities, staples, health care. Uh, but there are parts of the stock market I like, but the more defensive and I would say more dividend-oriented sectors. I think you'll be fine there. But I think there's going to be a nice trade, and I think it's already started in the 30-year Treasury bond because I think that it's a, there's too much inflation uh, narrative, uh, too much inflation priced in. But I think at the same time, people don't recognize that what's held the glue together, what's held the glue together for the economy has not been the Fed. The Fed's done that for the markets. For the economy, it's been these on-again, off-again fiscal stimulus measures. But guess what? The last big one from Biden in March is already running its course. And what Uh do you do for an encore? So I think the emperor gets disrobed. I think we'll start to see much weaker economic data past June and July. And I think that's going to trigger a a bull flattener in bonds. That's not going to be very good news for the for the banks, by the way. Uh, But maybe if you're going to be in the financials or financial likes, I probably want to be more in the utilities uh, and the REITs, uh, and I would say the staples, than be in the financials or in the commodity trade. In the commodities, so you, so you're not bearish on commodities necessarily. No, no, no. What I'm saying is that I, I I'm not. Uh, I think the value trade has run its course, uh, and I think mm-hmm. that. And so I would say that. Uh, I mean, I'm still a long-term fan of gold, um, and I guess that you can pick your points on secular shifts and copper as it's related to greening the world. But, you know, no, I'm not a, I, I think that, you know, I'm seeing the credit impulse indicator in China roll over. China's been deleveraging and the U.S. Mm-hmm. economy is going to be slowing down. So I don't know what else to say when you have 35% of global GDP cooling off. How are you going to be yeah. bullish on commodities, which really needs right. the global demand part of it? So yeah. I'd say, yeah, I'm a little circumspect on the, uh, on the demand side as far as it pertains to commodities, especially after the surge that we've already seen. I think there's going to mm-hmm. be other places to put your money to work. And I would say that, you know, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. And in the United States, when you think about it, the United States, the long bond trades like it is like it is high yield in the sovereign government bond space. <laughs> so I would say that's an area that, uh, and I know it's, it, when you look at those, those Bloomberg, Bloomberg, sorry, the Barron surveys, the, the treasury market is probably the most detest, the detested market on the yeah. planet. And you go yeah. back to Bob <laughs> Darrell. Yeah, exactly. Pretty compelling, pretty compelling, I think, to go the other way. On the yeah. consensus on this one. All right, Dave. All right, David. I, I will have to leave it go at that because because we're out of time. I want to thank you so much for for sharing your thoughts with us. Certainly, uh, some, you gave us some things to think about that are contrary to the uh, to the status uh, quo's thinking. But that's the reason we like to have you on. Thank you so much for being with us, David. And uh, all the best to you. <laughs>